Welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle, and thank you for joining me at www.sonic-cinema.com. Before we get started, join me at the Sonic Cinema Patreon at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. The rewards have already started up. I've got a couple of rewards on there right now. The most recent one is for $3 or more. Uh, the introduction of my book, Why is the Rabbit Wearing Sunglasses, which I hope to have out this coming summer. For patrons in general, I have an exclusive blog on the uh, Best Picture and Best Director nominees for the Oscars. I wasn't really going to do uh, Oscar commentary before this year, but with the nominees out last week, I decided to go ahead and give uh, my patrons my uh, thoughts on those. I've seen all of the nominees now, so I uh, was able to talk about them. So hope you enjoy that Patreon for Sonic Cinema. Today I have a very special treat. Um, for the second time on the podcast, I'll be joined by actor uh, Timothy J. Cox. He sent me a lot of his films over the years. And uh, today I wanted to do something very uh, different with him than just talking about his work, but I also wanted to ask him what his five favorite performances are and sort of get his perspective on great performances from an actor's point of view. I thought that would be interesting. And we might talk about some of my favorite performances as well, but uh, the spotlight will be primarily on Tim, so join me in welcoming uh, Timothy J. Cox to the podcast. Today I'm very pleased to uh, be joined by actor Timothy J. Cox. You'll uh, recognize his name from a lot of uh, movies that he sent me over the years, a lot of short films, a couple of feature films. Uh, today I decided I wanted to do something a bit different with him than just talking about uh, his own work. I wanted to uh, get his perspective on the favorite performances of his that he has watched over the years. And so uh, thank you very much to uh, join me, Timothy Cox. Thank you so much, Brian. Always great to chat with you. So I, one of the, I, I guess I shouldn't have been too surprised that when uh, I first brought up the idea of doing this episode, I uh, you you uh you you had a hard time bullying it down to five five performances. <laughs> um, it's hard. Yeah. Oh yeah. And actually, I I, I found that out myself. I would my boiled my uh, did my own list uh, for this. But the main one I want I want to focus mainly on yours. We we talked a little bit in the interview we did a couple of years ago, or a little over a year ago on uh, some of the actors and uh, performances that inspired you. But um, let's, let's, let's start off in... Uh, let, let me start off with uh, your list. Um, your, your list of five that you gave me, and it's, it's a terrific list of five. I completely understand why all of those uh, performances are on there. Uh, in no particular order, uh, there was Jack Lemon for Days of Wine and Roses, uh, Kate Blanchett for Blue Jasmine, Judy Dench for Notes on His Scandal, uh, Donald Sutherland for Ordinary People, and oh, Marlon Brando for uh, On the Waterfront. Oh yeah, um, that's easy. I think every actor probably picks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on the waterfront, uh, you know. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's 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 definitely a uh, performance that Brando's is definitely a performance that that is iconic. I mean, uh, he he's given a handful of those over the years. I think no more than on the waterfront, though. He won an Oscar. He won his first Oscar for the movie. And uh, it is legitimately a great performance. It is one of the great. Uh, performances, I think, and uh, one of the, I, I, I guess I'm kind of, what I want to, what I want to sort of get down to is uh, asking you sort of like what, 
apart from the fact that it's an iconic and great performance, what about, is there anything in particular about that performance that stands out to you and that really uh, inspired you as an actor? I think the thing about that particular movie, I mean, that movie probably revolutionized, changed American film acting. I mean, yeah, I mean, if, um, you know, De Niro, I mean, Albert Finney tells a story when he was uh, starting out at the uh, Royal Shakespeare in Rada, he would go into an audition and everybody would be sitting in the lobby dressed like Brando, doing their best <laughs> Brando because the wild one, and especially this performance in, on the waterfront was such an inspiration. I think for me, the thing about it was that, and you know, whenever I go back to it, I'm still blown away by it. I don't think I've ever seen a performance that was that raw as far as the vulnerability. I think, you know, in those early years, Brando had a streak of from the men, the wild one, streetcar, David Zapata, Julius Caesar, um, on the waterfront, of course, the young lions, where he just showed incredible vulnerability. And mm -hmm. I think actors of that earlier generation, you know, actors like Clark Gable and even Burt Lancaster were, I don't know, I think they were, I don't know if they were more concerned with their persona, but Brando kind of broke the doors off and said that a man can be strong, but also show sensitive sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, um, I mean, there are countless scenes in the movie where um, that you could pick and choose. People usually go to the cab scene with Rod Steiger, which of course is an iconic scene. Yeah, I prefer all all of his scenes with Eva Marie Saint mm -hmm. are um, are just as extraordinary. Um, there's just in moments where even when he's not speaking, you just kind of look into his eyes and you see that this is a very conflicted very tortured soul. He's kind of torn between two worlds. He's torn between, you know, his loyalty to uh, his brothers, familial loyalty to Johnny Friendly, of course. And he is in love with this, this girl. And mm -hmm. he's kind of torn between trying, having to do the right thing. And he knows that, um, you know, people are going to get hurt uh, as a result if, if he tells the truth and reveals what he knows. Yeah. And so it's a movie. I mean, that movie came out in 1954. I mean, Bud Schulberg and Elia Kazan and just, I mean, it's a flawless film. I mean, of course, Brando, but, you know, E.J. Cobb, Carl Ball, there's that, you know, just Stephen Brees, St. Everett, Rod Steiger, everybody. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. that's, about as per, that's about as perfect a movie as you could possibly get. And, uh, I think the thing, every time I go back to it with Brando, it's always just that, that thing that every actor always strives for in their work. It's just the ability to show a vulnerable side. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. And I definitely, I definitely think that um, to a certain extent with uh, Brando... I and certainly with those early performances, especially with uh, Streetcar and On the Waterfront, um, I I think there's there's a desire to be natural. There's a desire for him to be as natural and as believable as possible. Where it's not a traditionally theatrical performance, and I think that's what kind of dominated movies for the first few decades. Um, yeah. And it was with Brando and that generation of actors that you did start to see something more natural come up. And Ilya Kazan obviously was a big part of that in the movies that he was making as well. Absolutely. And, you know, actors like Tim and Montgomery Clift and Dean and Steve McQueen, I mean, you know, one of the greatest criticisms of Brando was that he always, people thought he always mumbled. I, I mean, I've seen just about every single film that Marlon Brando has done, and you know, even when he's not great, uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I never, I never saw a man who mumbled. I think yeah. that if if you compare him to Spencer Tracy and Jimmy Stewart and Cagney, I mean, obviously it's all very, very, very different schools. 
uh, approach and so I can methodology, whatever you want to call it. Um, so Brando just the kind of he's the right time, and I don't know. There was just something we were all just about him. I mean, um, you know, I mean, for 1954, I mean, going to streetcar. I mean, that scene where Kim Hunter walks down that spiral staircase, that's one of the sexiest scenes in movie history. Yeah. Because, and, you know, when Brando just drops down on his knees and her hands slowly run down his back, Mm -hmm. that is, I mean, that's, like, for 1951, I mean, you would, I imagine, I'd be surprised, I'm sure the censors probably had an issue with that (laughs) in 1951, whereas now, of course, you can, you know, do whatever you want, but, but that, I mean, the Brando, well, in that, in that, Brando brought that. Yeah, and and in that, in that time frame, you had you still had the production code. Uh, the actual movie rating system, as we know it now, was still a, like fifteen there. years away. It yeah. wasn't until the uh, mid to late sixties that we got the MPAA and the movie rating system the way we think about it. So yeah, you had the good old Jack, the, good old Jack Valenti. Yeah. <laughs> And and so you had the uh, production code, which was m- really much more strict than we would even. I mean, it you know there there's always it seems like there's always at least one or two movies a year that come out and they you you sort of question what the hell the MPAA was thinking as far as the rating, but the fact of the matter is it's like when when you compare to when you compare what. Uh, you can do now with that movie ring system versus the production code. It's a very different. It's a very different uh, Hollywood, and I mean, movies like On the Waterfront and Streetcar were a big part of uh, reshaping what the uh, the way uh, Hollywood portrayed sexuality and. Uh, just, just portrayed life in general. Oh yeah, and, well, I mean, you know, thinking in, thinking in terms of uh, street uh, on the waterfront. You know, there's the famous scene where Eve Marie Saint drops the glove and yeah. Brando, you know, it was uh, picks it up and he sticks his hand into the, you know, the things of the glove, mm-hmm. and Brando did that. And that is that's totally a sexual thing. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know. <laughs> And Kazan, it's like, you know, if you don't notice it, but it's, it's obvious. I mean, it's, uh, and she knows it, and, you know, and, I mean, it's, it's like little things that, uh, that color the performance and the whole film. It's, I mean, it's one that uh, I, I go back to all the time. It's, it's one of those movies that never, ever, 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 ever gets, uh, it never gets old, it never gets boring. Oh no, not at all. No, I mean I I've only seen it a couple of times over the years, but yeah, it is it it is is a fantastic movie. It is truly one of the better best movies ever made and it's and I mean it is Brando's performance is legendary for a reason in that. And it's uh it's easily it it is easily one of the uh one of the best the uh, big benchmarks of the nineteen uh, fifties and of uh, that generation of performances and acting and uh, movies. And Kazan and Brando never worked again. I, I I read Brando and Kazan's books. I don't recall offhand why that never happened because hmm. many many have felt that I think you know Brando you know big star after on the waterfront on his first Oscar and he did great films through the remainder of the 1950s and then somewhere I think Mutiny on the Bounty was when the tide kind of yeah. shifted I mean he I mean him and Elizabeth Taylor at that time they I think they were both getting million dollar contracts for both Cleopatra and mm-hmm. Mutiny on the Bounty and more or less bankrupted or close to bankrupted uh, I think it's 2050 yeah. and and um, I think I mean Brando could get away with murder. I think, and he, he mm-hmm. basically did on that film. So I think when he, whatever reason with him and Kazan, and it may have been politics or whatever, but I think Brando's career kind of suffered. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot. I mean, a lot of the films in the 1960s 
that have been kind of derided. He gave a brilliant performance in Reflections in a Golden Eye. It is a John Huston film, mm -hmm. and it was a role that Montgomery Cliff was supposed to do, but I think Montgomery Cliff uh, passed away. Brando stepped in. If you get a chance, it, it's based on a Carson McCullers uh, novel, and it's Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Robert Forster, I think it's his film debut, Brian Keith, and Brando. And it's a, a really, really, really underrated Brando performance. But of course, at that time, Brando was labeled box office poison. Um, even though the movie, and how they looked at it, they didn't think about him funky, but he did happen to do a couple of, by now, really, really smart. Mm -hmm. He also did a film called He also did a film called Burn, which he said was his best performance. I think he did it like nineteen sixty eight, nineteen seventy. But uh, the talent was always there. But I, you wondered, you always wished that he and Kazan had had another collaboration. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder, and I wonder, and I, I do. It, it does make you wonder why they never. I, it didn't even occur to me that they never will work together after. Uh, on the waterfront, um, I do wonder whether politics was a part of it. But uh, yeah, that is it is interesting to think when uh, actors' careers sort of go in end up going in a certain direction that you didn't necessarily expect them to. Uh, yeah. What might have happened if they had been able to uh, collaborate with some of their earlier collaborators uh, more? Right. Well, from everything I read, Kazan had a way of, a way with actors, a way especially with Brando, who was called Bud. You know, he, like, he, from everything like I had ever read, like, Kazan's like a, a father. And he said, I know Brando himself had a strained relationship with his own father. Mm -hmm. That um, Kazan, like, you know, understood Brando and was able to bring, I mean, you know, all of those early performances, he you know, Brando and Kazan together, Streetcar, of course, and Zapata and um, Waterfront. Yeah. And of course, he directed them on stage. I think Brando did that part on Broadway for two, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. on, uh, Streetcar. We could talk about Brando all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we definitely could. But so let's go ahead and uh, move to. Uh, the next film on your list, in terms of chronological order, it's uh, Jack Lemmon's performance in uh, 1962's Days of Wine and Roses. And uh, talk I, about something that we could talk about for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I just saw this movie for the first time last week in preparation for this uh, this this episode. It was the only performance that you uh, had listed that I hadn't seen yet. And, uh, mm -hmm. So I I saw it and I absolutely it it I completely see why it's on your list of your favorite performances. Uh, both Jack Lemmon and Lee Remick are absolutely fantastic in that movie. It's directed by Blake Edwards. Uh, right, right before the Pink Panther films yeah. I started, and so it's very different. Uh, side of uh, Blake Edwards' uh, career that I I'm not completely used to. I'm more used to his uh, comedic side, but um, I think as, as as brilliant as Blake Edwards was, you know, with, uh, comedies and um, craftsmanship as far as comedy, mm -hmm. The Great Race, another Jackman and Vehicle, it's mm -hmm. uh, really underrated uh, comedy. Uh, very colorful and fun. This, however, was he was in, Blake Edwards was an interesting choice for director, but it was good because the film starts out what you think is this kind of light, yeah, romantic love story, mm -hmm. and if you watch Lemon from the beginning of the film, you could see that he goes from how he goes from this social drinker to, yeah. and just be, falls further and further and further into the abyss. Mm -hmm. And then Lee Remick's character, who she doesn't usually drink alcohol, loves chocolate. And she's got that Brandy Alexander. Yeah. And, uh, it's a, um, I remember the first time I saw him, I was in high school and my oldest brother, Al, this was when, you know, VHSs were still, you know, everywhere. 
He right. came home and he threw this uh, VHS box on the table, and on the cover was Jack Lennon and Lee Remick, and he said, "Watch this movie." <laughs> and and I, you know, didn't quite know what to expect. I had seen The Apartment, and I had seen many of Jack Lennon's performances. I think the first Jack Lennon performance, oddly enough, that I ever saw was the China Singer, okay. which I is another another one of his best performances, I think. Mm-hmm. But um, I was I mean, just blown away. And this is one of the movies that, you know, and I've gone back time and time and time again, and just like, this this is why I'm an actor. Just because, I mean, there are countless scenes. I mean, the greenhouse scene, um, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, the, he is, Jack Lemmon himself has said when he was doing the straight jacket scene, he got so into it that when Bleak Edwards called cut, he actually had to go up and wrap his arms around Jack Lennon to calm him down. Oh, wow. Uh, just to kind of, because I remember at the time, yeah, and Hollywood still does this, they love to put you in, you know, your neat little pile. Jack Lennon was known as what was called a light comic actor. Yeah. He had done the Judy Holiday movie. He had done Mr. Roberts his first Oscar. And the thing is, it was all, to me, I, I always got a sense of it because if you watch the, the last scene of Mr. Roberts, when he reads the letter, I don't want to spoil anything, but if you see the video, you know what I'm talking about. And even the apartment, you see little traces of him going in the direction of being a very fine, as well as being a masterful yeah. comedy, but dramatic. This really changed I mean, you know, he getting up, uh, Jack Clinton was great in the film as well, and, 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 and getting up and saying the words, I am an alcoholic. Yeah. Um, movies had, I mean, The Man with the Golden Arm a couple of years before that Otto Preminger had directed had dealt with, I think, Frank Sinatra in one of his best performances. I think he felt, I think it was a heroin addiction. Yeah, I think, I think it was, it. yeah, I think it was drug addiction. It wasn't alcoholism. <laughs> but it, it didn't see, I mean, movies of that time didn't deal with addiction as raw and as honest and as true as uh, Days of Wine and Roses. And the fact that, I mean, that ending of the movie, um, you know, People when Warner Brothers, I think, was nervous about the ending because, you know, as you may know, it does not end on a happy note. No. I mean, it, it ends on a somber note. Yeah. But I think if it if it had ended on, you know, the happy note, I think I think the movie, I think it would have ruined the movie. I think. Oh, um, absolutely! Yeah. No, I mean the the way the way the movie ends is definitely the right way for it to end because. If if you do end it with uh, them getting back together, and you know it 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 just becomes a cheesy, it basically becomes a movie of the week. Yeah. It ba- and it and when when you start to get into the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous part of the movie, you you sort of see those television because it was based on a teleplay. And yeah, it was Cliff Robertson and Piper Laurie who did it on television. Yeah. yeah, and so, um, so you do kind of see that TV movie of the week, uh, type melodrama come in, but it mm-hmm. just it doesn't stay there. It doesn't it doesn't stay in that position. It basically just keeps going, and the more and more. You see Jack Lemon relapse. You see Lee Remick just can't get her shit together, and it's one of those things where it it just it 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 ends the only way it really could end because of the fact well, that and the thing is like like on the waterfront it deals with the um, it doesn't sugarcoat the mat it, it shows that addiction is a disease and um, you know as um, I had. Uh, family members who have been touched by by that addiction, and um, it's no joke. I mean, there's mm-hmm. no you are an addict the rest of your life, and it's an interesting thing the trajectory of, of, of Jack Lennon character. I mean, when you think in terms of like, I've always I'm always interested in thinking of like Jack Lennon's character in The Apartment. Mm-hmm. After that movie ends, he kind of becomes the character in Save the Tiger, the 
miserable businessman, and then it ends with him as Shelley the Machine in Glengarry. And in the middle there is Days of Wine and Roses, where, you know, he has this yeah. incredible fall. Um, now, it, I mean, that's another one that I, I go back to uh, all of the time. And as, and as brilliant as, as Jack Lemmon is, Lee Remick, uh, and sadly, that was her only Oscar nomination. I mean, she, um, and, and she died too early. I think she passed away in 1990. Oh, wow. And, uh, and gorgeous up until the day she passed. Um, but she was absolutely gorgeous. And, mm-hmm. and the thing is also, it's very famous also because the Henry Mancini, the song and the musical score. Yeah. It really does a wonderful job of, of setting up what you think is this very light romantic comedy, mm-hmm. but really it just turns on a dime and it's just a punch in the gut. Very real, very honest um, look about the crumbling of this family, really. Yeah. Uh, how it affects uh, Charles Bickford, he's wonderful, and uh, Lee Remick's father, Jack Klugman again, and Jack Albertson's in there. I mean, there's just, uh, it's a it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous. Oh, yeah, it really is. And, yeah, when, when it, it is, and I think it's that first, that setup where you get the impression that it's going to be a light, you know, sort of romantic comedy from those times where it is essential to have Blake Edwards directing it because of the fact that that's the type of movie that you associate with him. And then the fact that he can he can turn on that dime along with his actors is just really... It, it just shows a level of Blake Edwards that if all you know of them is Pink Panther, Shot in the Dark, and that franchise, you're you're missing this entire other part of him. And, and it's also noted that, you know, he also did a, a, a wonderful film, very underrated film, another film with Jack Lemmon and Julie Andrews called That's Life, mm-hmm. which he did in 1986, which was kind of um, autobiographical about Blake and Blake Edwards and Jack London turning 60 mm-hmm. at the time. And it was, and it was a family affair. And it was, uh, Jack London's son, Chris was in it. He played his son and Julie Andrews children. And a really, and Robert Moja has a really funny, uh, and Sally Callum are really funny in it, but it's another, they collaborated, uh, again. And it's an, another really very sweet, a uh, little combination of comedy and uh, drama that, uh, if you get a chance, I uh, highly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely really interested in a lot of Blake Edwards films. I've there are a lot that I haven't seen. I, you know, I mean, before Days of Blind Roses, basically what I knew from him was uh, the Pink Panther movies and then Ten. So I mean, yeah. I definitely, I definitely want to see uh, more of his films. Uh, Sob is funny as well. Sob, he got in a lot of trouble for Sob for the case yeah. after it was about. <laughs> Hollywood, and he mm-hmm. blatantly had, I mean, I think Robert Bourne played Robert Evans, which, you know, yeah. uh, and really ahead of his time, and uh, he was the Holden Western, but really, really funny satire mm-hmm. about Hollywood before Altman did the player, but I mean, I think Blake Edwards really got, got a lot of crap to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's funny, this one, another podcast that I listened to, A's All Over, when they were talking about SOB, it's like, it got me really interested in that movie, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely want to see it for myself. Uh, so, so moving on with uh, your performances, the performances you listed, we'll go to uh, 1980 and Donald Sutherland in Ordinary People. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was this was another movie I saw in I think early December. I never seen it before. I never really taken the opportunity to see it before. But um, I, I made a point of seeing it. Uh, and I when when I was making my list, the uh, performance that I really loved in that one and that really stood out as one of my favorite performances I think of all time is uh, Timothy Hutton as uh, oh, yeah. Donald Sutherland and Mary Tyler, Tyler Moore's uh, son in that movie. And, it's a uh, it's it's a it's a marvelous film. I mean, 
you know, many people, I mean, people who love to talk about, you know, the Oscars and like how, you know, movies of years past. And of course, that won the Academy was the best director for Robert Redford and Best Picture. And it was up against Raging Bull. Yes. And, and there are countless people who say, how the hell did, you know, did they give that Oscar to, you know, Raging Bull? Is, it, I mean, it's, the Oscars are all the apple, it's the ultimate apples and oranges. You can't compare. Yeah. Um, two very, 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 very different films. Um, the film, it, it, uh, it really does hold up. I mean, mm-hmm. um, the, the thing that I re- have always liked about Ordinary People, and it's another one of those films, and I, I had seen it first, like when I was very young, and then when I was in high school, I went to Catholic school, mm-hmm. and we watched it, we watched it in religion class. Huh. And I remember I, we were, I was watching that last scene, the Donald Sutherland and Mary Tyler Moore, where he tells her he doesn't love her anymore. Mm-hmm. And just something, just something just clicked again. And, and it's a funny story about that scene. They had filmed the scene with him crying throughout the entire scene. Mm-hmm. And they went back, and I guess they watched The Rushes, and Donald Sutherland liked that, I guess. And they had felt that uh, they wanted to reshoot it. They had to reshoot it without, I think, I think they had to reshoot it without Mary Tyler Moore, mm-hmm. of kind of like the aftermath that he had been crying and that when she encounters him, he was just coming down from just this, you know, decision that he was going to make. And he's great. And it's just, it's this very quiet, you know, and he just looks at her and he says, you are beautiful. Yeah. Because he knows that he has to, he knows what he's going to say. He knows that this marriage that, you know, I love you, but, or I don't love you because mm-hmm. I don't know who you are. And it's just, it's such a punch in the gut. Yeah. The end of the film that also is just a punch in the gut is Donald Sutherland and Timothy Hutton is that last scene in the film and where you get the sense that this is the first time that they're really having a serious conversation. Yeah. And um, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful film. I mean, and it's the thing, you know, it, it came, that movie came out on the heels of, you know, as far as the Oscars, so like Kramer versus Kramer. And yeah, I guess there one could make the argument that, you know, they have one kind of family drama when the best picture and kind of a family drama in you know, the next year. But I mean, uh, it holds up very, very, very well. Oh, Mary yeah, Tyler Moore. Yeah. And just brilliant. Judd Hirsch. I think Gene Hackman is supposed to play the that part originally and um, Judd Hirsch stepped in and uh, is equally brilliant with Elizabeth McGovern and her film debut and Evan Walsh. Yeah. I mean, uh, but Sutherland, he has, he has so many, I mean, I think, and I'm, I'm so thrilled and delighted that he finally won an Oscar. He won the last time he an Oscar. I mean, this is a guy who's been around for 50 years and yeah. never won the nominated for an Academy Award, but um, finally was acknowledged. Um, talk about a million actors to do anything. Uh, this, he, he, was, he was so subtly, like, he, he's just a man, obviously grieving also for the loss of his son, but in a very, very different way, trying to, you know, hold, hold this family together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's just it's just brilliant to watch. Mm-hmm. No, and you're you're absolutely right that the movie really does hold up very well. And yeah, Suther- Sutherland is ba- he you're like you said he is playing the father is basically trying to keep this family together while also trying to having to process his own grief. And I I think that's that's one of the amazing things that I mean Redford as a Director, I I'd seen enough Redford over the years to where I knew how talented he was with <laughs> actors as a director. But I mean you really see in this first film of his why he's so good. And it's because of the fact that it, it's going back to Brando. It's going back to uh the the idea that there's a very natural uh sense of these characters as people as opposed to just characters in a play that is 
being done. You know, it's, yeah. it's it's very it's very natural, and I there there really is there isn't a false note between any of the actors. I I think the reason that Hutton stood out for me is because of the scenes with Judd Hirsch in particular, and you know, as somebody who's been in therapy myself, I can look at that and I can see that I feel like. I feel like that's one of the best portrayals of that process and what good real therapy looks like uh, that we've seen in movies. Most movies don't really, they most movies don't really get as right as that that movie does. And I I think it, the, it gets ugly. Yeah. Yeah. It gets, and, it gets you got to dig deep. I mean, uh, and. And Di- I have to mention Dinah Manoff as well, who plays, uh, I forget the name of the character, the friend who, oh gosh, she has that wonderful line, she says, I want this to be the best year ever. Yeah. And they uh, meet him with Dinah. And, uh, oh God, uh, uh, it holds, I mean, it's, um, it, and it's very moving. Yeah. And like, and of course, when Donald Sutherland goes and sees uh, John Hirsch, and he says, I, I wish I knew why the hell I'm here. Because he knows that he has something in him that he's trying to hold on to this marriage. He's trying to hold on not only to the marriage, but to the relationship with his son. Because he knows, I mean, he knows how hard it is. I mean, you know, it means... Mm-hmm. One of the things I like about Sutherland in this movie is that he... he mi- I, I feel like he... You know, I mean, it's the dynamic between him and Mary Tyler Moore when it comes to Timothy Hutton's character is that, you know, Mary Tyler Moore's character is can't get rid of the... She can't stop blaming Timothy Hutton yeah. for losing their son, but Donald Sutherland is trying not to and doing and trying to convince her, no, it's... it's you can't blame him for what happened. And well, and, you know, she was one of those mothers that, you know, her firstborn, and she just showered all of that love onto him that, in, in essence, in, essence um, in many ways, she kind of forgot about yeah. Conrad's character. And when that, I mean, that, that part of her was ripped out. I mean, there was just a kind of a, a coldness. I mean, they, when her and Timothy Hutton have that, very, very, very awkward conversation because like just them trying to somewhat her trying in her way to connect. It's just it's heartbreaking, and you, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, you almost want to. Whenever you see something like that, you almost want to call your parents to just say thank you for, <laughs> thank you yeah. for, you know, the relationship that we have, the warmth and the, that we have, and mm-hmm. some people. I mean, Mary Tyler Moore, and of course that was a gamble because Mary Tyler Moore. Um, had never, ever, 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 ever played <laughs> a role like that. I mean, it was completely opposite of her television persona. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, she was great. She was great. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, she she's absolutely fantastic in that movie. I mean, every everybody's great in that movie. I mean, it's like, like, like you said, it does hold up extremely well. Um, it's... I, I think I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad I'm I'm seeing it for the first time when I did, because I think if I had seen it earlier in my life, I probably would have had more of that chip on my shoulder of, well, how could this film be Raging Bull? I don't think I would appreciate it quite as much as I do now. And uh, I know, and ab- absolutely, I mean, it's a credit to. Uh, it, it's a credit to Robert Redford and Alvin Sargent who wrote the uh, screenplay. Oh yeah, that, the uh, that actors like Donald Sutherland and Mary Tyler Moore and Timothy Hutton and Judd Hirsch just have so much great material to play off of, and that all feels very natural and very honest. Well, and you hit it right there. I think the one thing that a lot of, that all three of these films that we discussed so far have in common is that all of them present one side of things and it turns on a diamond and, pres- and something else happens. Like ordinary people present this on the surface, this kind of picture-perfect family. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and the reality is is that they're anything but. And that's you know, every every family every family has um you know, no no one is perfect. Um and I think that's one of the reasons why it it, it resonated. I think also because it was not played melodramatically. It was played it's a, it's a quiet yeah. Even from the moment, the opening moment of that piano tour, the cannon begins to play. It, it's just kind of um, the camera work of just showing the neighborhood, showing the streets, and showing um, this world. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's uh, that just makes me want to go and watch all these movies again. <laughs> <laughs> so moving, moving on. Uh, we go to uh, 2006, and uh, your inclusion of Judy De- Dench from uh, No Time Scandal, which mm. I have not seen since I saw it in theaters. Uh, if you could, um, because I don't know how well known this movie is in particular. Uh, the other ones, I mean, they're all from pretty uh, significant filmmakers, and. Uh, you know, have pretty significant parts of uh, movie history. So if you could uh, just sort of enlighten us on uh, what what notes of a scandal is and what is it about Judy Dench's performance in that movie that... Well, as I recall, I mean, it's been a couple of years since I've seen it myself. And of course, in, in the case of Judy Dench and Kate Blanchett, you could pick any performance uh, what they've done, and it would be good enough for it on any list. The thing about this particular movie and this particular performance set is I just remember how cold and cunning this one was. Judy Dench plays a teacher I recall, in an all-boys school, and a new teacher, Kate Blanchett, comes, and Judy Dench is like the I don't know if she's ever been married or anything like that, but she basically uh, befriends uh, Kate mm-hmm. Blanchett. But uh, it's discovered soon that Kate Blanchett's character develops an affair with one of her students, which yeah. Judy becomes aware of. And almost kind of, you know, more than I kind of has to make uh, Kate Blanchett choose and basically ruins her life just because Kate Blanchett, I guess, chose the student over. Uh, Judy Dench, as far as friendship. I think that's, I mean, it's probably an oversimplification of the entire movie. Yeah. But um, there is kind of a, I, I would say, if this movie were done in like the 1940s or 50s, it's a role that it would be played by someone like a, like, Jude, like Mrs. Danvers, that Judith Anderson played in Rebecca. Like just someone that you want, you don't want to get on her band side. Yeah, <laughs> and she, um, Bill Nye, is is Kate Blanchett's husband in the film, and he's brilliant. And there's just something about uh, Judy Dench in this performance that it just sends chills. Yeah, it's a chilling performance. And of course, I think I mean that this was the time when Judy Dench, you know, every performance that she gave, mm-hmm. it she just went from one prestige film performance uh, to another. And she and Kate Blanchett were both nominated for Oscars for the performances. And um, it, it, it sticks out to me as do all of Judy Dench's performances, just because the character is just completely unforgettable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's it's it's, it's mystery, it's part, of course, you know, searing drama, but really it, it focuses mostly about just this woman who is ruthless in yeah. wanting to kind of retain this friendship. And, uh, you know, it you know, kind of makes my skin crawl just thinking about it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's I I feel like I need to see it again because of the fact that I I don't I don't think it resonated with me quite that strongly when I first saw it. But I mean, you know, it's Kate Blanchett, it's Judy Dench, they're and I, both. And I always... should mention, I probably did a terrible job of uh, giving a synopsis of the film. So, but uh, but uh, I, for anyone who's listening, I highly recommend go see the movie. And uh, I don't know if it was based on a novel. Yeah, I think um, it is. I, I think it is, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but but uh, it's a it's a it's a marvelous marvelous. Film. 
Yeah, and I do remember I do remember that performance sticking out among Judy Dench's career. Like it was very different from anything else we had really seen her in in that time of yeah. time frame. So yeah, it was it was one that definitely stuck out with me, not not quite as strongly as uh, it did for you. But um yeah, I it is it is a movie I probably do want to go go back and see and just see how I feel about it now. Um, so we're going to move from uh, Notes on a Scandal, and we're going to go from Judy Dench in that movie to her co-star in that movie, and the last p- performance in your uh, five that you gave me, Kate Blanchett in uh, Woody Allen's Blue Jasmine. And I do have to... Mm-hmm. This is probably her performance in that movie is probably one of my favorite performances in a Woody Allen film that I've seen. It is absolutely fantastic. I that was there there are times where his films have been really good or not that great. And uh, even, even at the time, uh, Kate Blanchett's performance for, in that movie really stood out as one of the best ones. Among, uh, well, and it's, I mean, you want to talk about, I mean, I think she is probably our greatest living actor, actor, actress ever. I mean, I remember this summer I saw her in Thor, the, the latest Thor film. And yeah. she was absolutely wonderful. She was hysterical. I wanted yeah. to do more comedy. Yeah. <laughs> but um, this, I mean, um, the thing about her in this performance that was just, I mean, it knocked me out when I, when I saw it in the theater was the range of emotions mm-hmm. that she was playing. It's very difficult to play someone who is, you know, is descending into kind of madness. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's very difficult to play these kinds of scenes. I imagine very similar to how it is to play a kind of drunk scene. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, if you watch my, my, to me, the definitive drunk is Albert Finney at Under the Volcano, where basically he spends about 90% of the film in a state of drunkenness that, you know, would, would the average person would, you know, <laughs> not been down for uh, bed for a week. Yeah. And with, with, with Kate Blanchett in Blue Jasmine, it's just that the descent into just madness, like very much, I think there are obviously parallels to Blanchette Law, um, you know, certainly you know, some kind of similarities, like as far as, you know, this, you know it's a, kind of a habitual uh, teller of tall tales. And yeah. uh, it, um, but it's really just a, um, it's it's really an extraordinary performance. I happen to be a very big fan of Woody Allen, and I and I know Woody Allen is you know back in the news right now. A lot of actors are coming out and saying that they regret their appearance in some of his movies. Mm-hmm. Dying keep coming to his defense. Um, whatever separating you know the filmmaker from the man, a lot of his movies. I don't think there's anyone, you know, being Mark Scorsese, who has told New York stories better yeah. than this person. Yeah. And this is, you know, I mean, I've met, you know, a few uh, uh, characters like the, certainly like the, um, the Kate Blanchett character in the city, just, um, you know, people who have, think in their mind that they want something more than, um, and are, are something more than they really are. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's just, I mean, you know, you just wonder how actors get in that zone uh, of just uh, playing just the descent and that every scene that she does in that film, yeah. she just keeps far further and further and further and further into the abyss. Mm-hmm. Into the abyss. I don't think Woody Allen's ever quite done a movie quite like that. Maybe interiors. Geraldine Page plays a character who I think that's probably Blue Jasmine and Interiors, which was his homage to Ingmar Bergman's films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they're very similar in that respect as far as Geraldine Page is just her just descent over the breakup of this marriage where 
E.G. Marshall taking it with another woman. Yeah, and I know uh, for for me, I think with you know it it is a it's a it is a complicated uh, discussion right now when it comes to Woody Allen, and it really has been for a few years now. Um, yeah. But I think one of the things. I think part of the reason that Blue Jasmine stands out is probably one of the ones that I really like the most is because it also it gets away from the uh, sort of neurotic uh, Woody Allen or character or Woody Allen stand-in character that really seemed to uh, dominate a lot of his work. And I think when he gets away from that, and he he is he is really regardless of how how you feel about him as an individual he he is a fantastic writer and director when he's on uh, when he's on point and when he has when he has an idea that he really wants to make work and Blue Jasmine's definitely one of them and that's one of the things that I think stands out about it because of the fact that. It's such a great performance for a woman. Like it's it's not just it's it's not just a standard issue of female character. I mean, Hannah and her sisters is kind of the same way. It's like the the, the women in, or Mia Farrow in Purple Rose of Cairo. It's like there's yeah. something about those roles that are just. They're completely unique, and they're completely they're foreign to him in the sense that it's like I don't think he he's not putting a lot of himself into those into those characters when he writes them, and I think that's one of the reasons they stand out so much. Right? Yeah. No, I mean if they um, I mean Woody Allen's movies like Hannah and Her Sisters, I I think is my favorite Woody Allen film. So you know, it's act, I mean, I love I've always been a fan of ensemble. And, the, and I should say the ensemble where Blue Jasmine is based on Sally Hawkins, of course. And of course, Andrew Dice Clay. Yeah. I mean, that was the thing. That when I saw him in the movie, I said, Dice. I mean, he <laughs> and Louis and Louis C.K., all, who is also in Hot It seems, yeah. Woody Allen, I guess, uh, he's, he's got Alex Baldwin, who's in Hot Water now as well. And he always, he's perpetually in Hot Water. It yeah. Seems. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, it's a. Um, I, I, I remember one of the criticisms of the film when it came out. Someone, I, I forget who it was, a colleague of mine, or a critic or whatever, said that they dismissed the film as I, I have no patience for movies about rich people's problems. <laughs> and I guess one could, yeah, I don't know that. Uh, I, I look at it differently. I mean, I just looked at it, you know, not. It, it, just from an individual standpoint, like yeah. just this woman, um, and also the thing is also you know her delusions, uh, very much like um, in some ways of uh, Blanche Dubois. Many of it were in some ways very. You just kind of shake your head at and amused by. It. Yeah. No. And and yeah. I mean the 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 more when when you know you 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 bring up your. Uh, your your friend's criticism is like yeah that that is that's a good point but yeah I mean ultimately I I didn't really uh, think too much about that I was I was just so it didn't entranced. bother me yeah. no I was I was just so entranced by her performance and yeah there's so many other really fantastic performers and performances in that movie and yeah I mean a- Andrew Dice Clay is one of the ones that stand out because of the fact that it's, he really you, between that and his work on um, I think he was in the first or second episode of Vinyl the HBO uh, series yeah. sadly the last he uh, and it was like I'm like good for him like you know bravo I mean um, yeah, it's interesting I, I have I have no idea how this you know with Woody Allen I don't I don't know how this plays out yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't see Wonder Wheel. I mean, I would see Kate Winslet in anything, but uh, I don't know if this thing with Woody Allen contributed to the fact that she didn't really get to get on in those awards. I, yeah. That. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen Wonder Wheel either. I've actually, I think Blue Jasmine was the last Woody Allen film I've actually seen. Um, Wonder Wheel just, even, even before... 
he oh. really started to become a uh, part of the conversation again as far as uh, people working with him. Even when I saw the preview for One Wheel, it just it didn't seem interesting to me, and it just wasn't didn't seem like it was on par. I'm like you, I I love Kate Winslet, and I'll watch her in anything, but. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I, I didn't really have much of an inclination to uh, watch Wonder Reel. And, you know, I'm, I'm going back, I've been going back and uh, watching some of his older films, some of them for the first time. And it's like, it is, is one of the things that, um, that is, is part of the thought process of, well, how much, how much do I want to give? How much uh, time do I want to give talking about Woody Allen? I mean, there are films of his I absolutely want to talk about. I mean, I I going back to uh, watching uh, Annie Hall for the first time in a lot of years this year for a movie a week. And at some point, I want to include uh, Boats Over Broadway, which was one of my favorite films of his for a long time. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, think it's... right now, I think right now in, in the, the climate, um, I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a wonderful time. Uh, I mean, of course, of course, all of these things that have been going on in the industry and not just in Hollywood, but in politics and yeah. sports and stuff like that, are now coming to light as they should. My thing is, um, my my feeling is the people who are coming forward. Make sure I work this correctly. People who are coming forward now saying they regret appearing in a Woody Allen film. What did, no, did anyone put a gun to your head saying that you had to work with him in the first place? Yeah, and the fact of the matter is, I and the fact of the matter is, it's like at at the time that they started to appear in his films, who's going to say no? Who, who's going well, to and that, say no? that's the thing. I mean, I mean. Yeah, it's, so it's in, in some cases, I mean, I don't, I, I, I can, I, I mean, this, I, I don't know any, uh, none of the actors are coming to mind, but the outrage that they have now, why didn't they have that beforehand? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a very delicate uh, matter. I mean, it, it, it's a bit amazing, you know, over the last couple of months. I mean, when I, I was in California doing uh, a play. When it was first revealed that uh, Kevin Spacey, oh wow, and just and that was just like you know heartbreaking. And when yeah. that happened, like the story with him and Anthony Rapp, I think Kevin Spacey was doing Long Day's Journey into Night in New York, which was his first big Broadway show with Jack London, yeah, who was his idol. And um, now, I mean, I, I I mean, as we saw at the SAG Awards. Both flows. I mean, uh, women, as they should, are are you know stepping up to the plate and holding people accountable. And um, I I know that all of these revelations that are coming out. I know it's not the end. I think, sadly, with every day that when I see my Facebook or Twitter feeds, if I see an actor's name, yeah, you know, uh, you get a little nervous. Like mm-hmm. I think when when Christopher Plummer was. Uh, his name started appearing in the Twitter feed. I thought, oh no, Christopher Plummer. I mean, sadly, I saw that Christopher Plummer had died. Yeah. But then uh, that I said that Christopher Plummer is taken over for uh, Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey in, that, in the movie, <laughs> and of course, he gets an Oscar nomination. Yeah. And that, that's that's there's there's a beauty in that. Mm-hmm. Part of me, I, I think, had wanted James Franco to get an Oscar nomination for. For me, because if you get an Oscar nomination for playing Tommy Wiseau, you basically should be automatically <laughs> knighted. Yeah, but it's a, it was it was a good movie. It was a, I mean, comedy performances are rarely acknowledged. Anyway, yeah. it was a fine performance. Um, I think I think the writing nomination I think richly deserved because uh, I, I would agree but, with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a long shot. I think mm-hmm. of them getting the uh, an Oscar nomination. Yeah, and, and, you know, while we're on the topic, yeah, I saw Disaster Artist finally last week, and I'm I'm with you. It's like James Franco's really good, and it. it's a very good impression of why so. I don't know that we've necessarily been in my my top five for, like, this year, 
but I do agree with you that the screen the screenwriting nomination was very deserved for it. I very much I was, deserved. I got very nervous about what type of film that was going to be uh beforehand. And so I'm really glad that they I felt like they threaded the needle between sort of an Ed Wood type comedy of errors movie. Yeah. And and just, you know, not really lionizing what he did, but you know, getting a point across that it's like there's something to be said for his dreamers. Determination. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, yeah. And it's also well, and I think also it, it it what it really did. I think it it really had a lot of respect for. I think I think it didn't. It was a spoof. It didn't make fun of them. Yeah. Because um, I mean, you go you go on YouTube, and there are people who who donate you know whole videos just to uh, parody and making fun of Tommy Wiseau. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it was a very. I mean, if you've ever read the actual book of the disaster, I actually found I actually found the book rather right bad. Uh, just, uh, but uh, it's a very, very, very interesting and fascinating read. Yeah. But uh, a little sad. So, um, well, have I, you seen all of the Oscar films? Or I, I did. I finally I got to Fam Thread last night, so I have seen all of the Best Picture nominees. I just need to I uh, I need to catch up with some of the acting nominees. I Tanya, I still haven't seen, still haven't seen all the money oh, in the world. Oh, um, oh wow, yeah. Uh, so it's been, it, it was a good year. It was a really really it really, it wild really was year actually yeah yeah it really was um, and yeah watching because I think. Like in the past week alone, I saw the post, "Call Me by Your Name" and "Phantom Thread," and so yeah, I I wasn't wasn't Michael Stuhlbarg. I, I think if there was anyone who was snubbed, it was Michael Stuhlbarg, who I think was in every movie this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he he, he was uh, he was really good in "Call Me by Your Name." Overall, he he has a. He has a speech, that speech in the end of that movie that is about as good as anything yeah. that I've seen yeah. in a long, long time. Like, just honest, sweet, and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing we need right now. And, yeah. Um, and honestly, like, that yeah, movie, I didn't really love that movie. I There were, like, the first part of it I felt was kind of boring. It took a while to get going. But overall, I mean, I liked it. I thought there were... I I thought once you got to once you once you really got into all of the uh, romantic st- stuff that starts to come into play, that's when the movie got interesting. I think sure. like, all of the the stuff before that, a lot of it was just oh, it's very pretty cinematography of Italy, and that's kind of about it. There were some scenes there that were uh, good, but I mean, it was hard for the movie to keep my interest for, but yeah, that, that speech of his at the uh, end to his son was really great. Yeah. Really was a terrific moment in that film. And the nice thing about, you know, the, I mean, the Oscar nominations and everyone, I mean, I can't, I don't think there's a clear winner. I mean, I think Gary, I think Gary Oldman has a lock on. Yeah. The yeah. best actor, and uh, but I don't. I mean, I don't know about any of the others. I mean, and possibly Sam Rockwell. Although I wouldn't count out Willem Dafoe. I wouldn't count out any of them. I mean, yeah, uh, Willem, you know, Willem Dafoe. Tour. Yeah, Willem Dafoe is definitely who I'm rooting for in the uh, supporting actor right now. I I absolutely thought it was amazing in Florida Project. That was what a wonderful. What a wonderful movie! Yeah, that was, that was the kids were extraordinary. Yeah, that was that was my big uh, that was my big issue as far as how how little that ended up going. I would have loved to have seen that in the best picture category, um, but mm-hmm. uh, no, I I definitely hope Willem Dafoe wins. Uh, let's see, I I mean I'm still there are still some performances I'm missing. Best actress, I I'm trying to figure out like who exactly I would like to see to win their win there. I think Margot Robbie is the only one that I haven't seen for Itania. She's marvelous. And the thing is, um, it, it's a really revelatory 
performance from her. I mean, it's uh, very raw, very uh, heartbreakingly good. Yeah. And uh, no, I mean, all of that. Uh, are, it, it, it's a really solid, solid, solid performance, a solid group of mm-hmm. actors in all of the categories. And of course, all of the, um, I, think, I forget, I, I'm terrible, I forget the woman's name, but the first female to be nominated for cinematography. Oh, yeah. For, uh, uh, what was oh it? My God, Mudbound? I'm, I'm terrible, I forget the name. Mudbound yes. was the movie, yes. right? Which, yeah. Yes, which was another. Ex- I mean, that's another another excellent movie. It's, the thing is the the variety, and yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of nice. You know, every couple of years, you know, you can go into the Oscars and you go, okay, well, you know, <laughs> the, this person's going to win, and most and a lot of times they deserve it. And then, of course, you know, you get a surprise every once in a while, like when everyone but the supporting actor a year or two ago people thought Stallone was going to take it richly deserved for Creed and then Mark Rylance. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's, all, it's nice to be delightfully surprised. I think mm-hmm. before that, I think the last time I had been surprised was when Adrian Brody. Yeah. Won that was, yeah. Well, well, yeah. And that was the last real big shocker. Shocker was Adrian. Well, Brody and Cra- I think crash crash winning the best picture, I think. Was oh yeah. But I mean, I, I was, I was thinking more along the lines of for the performances. performances. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there really hadn't been be, until Mark Rylance. There hadn't really been a uh, another actor since Adrian Brody that really just completely taken everybody by surprise. Um, yeah, a, del- a delightful game. shock. I think that's yeah. a, a um, wonderful film, wonderful performance as well. No, it's 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 definitely an interesting race. I mean, I you know the fact that better is it's like I. Especially in thinking about best director, like I, I would like to see all five of them win. Honestly, like I, I could make an argument for any of those five winning. Uh, it's probably the most competitive directors race we've seen in a long time. Oh yeah, and, so, uh, so and, many different schools. <laughs> I mean, I mean Christopher Nolan, what he did with Dunkirk. I mean, it was in a style of like. David Lee kind of grand scale. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, as far as the scope. Um, uh, and the, oddly enough, this is actually, I think it's his first directing uh, nomination. Yes, it is. And, it's, uh, it's like, it's ironic that it's his first directing nomination and probably the most competitive the category's been in a long time. I, I think if he had, I think if, if, it hadn't been for like Shape of Water and Get Out and uh, those two in particular, but I mean, I I could almost you could you could make a legitimate argument I think for any of those uh, five winning it, and which I, is which is great because yeah. I mean all of them are richly deserving. I mean, uh, it's been nice to see Greta Gerwig's uh, reaction. Uh, I mean, I'm watching all, you know, she's done several interviews to CBS Sunday morning, and it's just, it's just wonderful to see Jordan Peele, of course. I mean, who would have guessed? Uh, I mean, my wife and I, we just watched Get Out again recently, and it's yeah. just, and it's extraordinary the second time around. <laughs> it still gets you. Oh, it yeah. I, no, and that was time. that was what I reckon that was why I noticed when I saw it get out again for the first time since I had seen it in theaters in December was that it's it it works so well and you start to you start to see more and more of the way he sets up what the uh what the end game is and just what exactly that is and you really see yeah. how well you pick up on little cues the second yeah. time uh, around but the you just you know, the, the ride is extraordinary. And you know, Lady Bird, and uh, we love Three Billboards, especially, just because yeah. Francis McDormand is a force mm-hmm. of nature, and uh, yeah. Martin McDonough, who, you know, uh, I mean, just, you know, extraordinary. And Sam Rockwell, if, if there's an actor who has been due for this kind of acknowledgement, and Willem, I mean, all of them, Richard Jenkins as well. I mean, yeah. it, it's kind of nice that uh, I think... And you never know. I mean, like Gary Oldman and Timothy Chalamet might uh, come through. I think the longest shot in the best actor category is Roman J. Israel and so Washington for oh, Jim, yeah. Roman J. Israel. 
which I, I haven't seen yet, but I hopefully will get a chance to see it before the Oscars. I completely I, missed I it love in theaters. Night, Night, Dan Gilroy, who did Nightcrawler, which I think is one of yeah. the best performances that Jake Gyllenhaal has ever given. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it was, it, 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 you know, I thought that the film was a little all over the place. It didn't, it kind of wanted to be this kind of, um, kind of drama about him and then it morphed into this kind of history. I will say this though. Denzel Washington, as he is in everything he does, is he's he's it's he's, he's brilliant. Yeah. 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 That that it's a brilliant performance. Yeah, that that didn't that doesn't surprise me. And uh yeah, I I, I miss I just miss him in theaters. I wanted to see it before we before we lost it, but I didn't get a chance to, so uh I'm I'm waiting for it to come out and uh, digital and this, so I can watch it there uh, before the Oscars. Um, the good news is, is that it's, I mean, it's an exciting, it's always exciting Oscar time, you know, to yeah. watch all of the uh, the movies and, uh, you know, it seems the show is getting longer and longer every year. <laughs> I wonder if Warren Beatty is going to be presenting Best Picture again. I, I would imagine no, but you, you never know. Uh, no, you never I, know. I, you I, never I, know. I love, yeah, I love not really having an idea as to what exactly is going to win, and that's one of the. I mean, yeah, you can you can point to a couple of things in the uh, like Gary Oldman. I think I think Allison Janney is probably going to win supporting actress, and uh, even she's though getting a lot of momentum. Uh, I mean, one would have yeah. said a couple of months ago that Metcalf had a uh, had a yeah. lock. On uh, on the on on it, uh, and all richly deserving. And well, the thing is also, you know, Octavia Spencer, who whoever her agent is, <laughs> um, they got the golden touch because she has just yeah. gone from one prestige uh, film to another. And uh, mm-hmm. it, it's it's nice it's nice to see. It's 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 very very nice <laughs> to see. So uh, I'm sure we'll be into some surprises. Yeah, that's that's definitely uh that's that's definitely going to be uh interesting to watch. I I I have to admit for the most part I was kind of checked out of like the Oscar conversation. I wasn't that terribly interested in it this year and then when the nominations came out it's like wow, this is actually a pretty decent list. And so it all of a sudden it got me excited about it again. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm definitely interested in seeing uh Seeing what happens, and uh, I definitely am hoping to catch up with as many of the uh, nominees, if not all of them, before uh, Oscar time. One of the one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast with you to sort of get back to the original topic at hand, but that was a really great divert. Uh, yeah, that was that was a really great uh, di- diversion from the uh, original conversation. It was a natural one because we were talking about Woody Allen, then we talked about James Franco, and then that just led to... I'm all about diversion. <laughs> so, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast with you was I wanted to... I I was really curious to, to get an actor's perspective on what whether what you look for in performances if there's something in particular that you look at in performances that sort of um makes something stand out uh compared to like what I would look for in performances as a critic and as somebody who is just a fan of movies and uh I was just kind of that was one of the things that was really interesting to me when uh when I first started thinking about this idea? It's a, um, I mean, I think like, I mean, when I want like the actors that I've referenced, uh, and then, I mean, in the long list, I mean, I had, I think I got it to like 30 and I had to whittle it down (laughs) and it was like, Oh, well, maybe this guy, maybe that guy. I mean, or that, uh, you know, performance. It's, um, it's something like that moves you. Like, it's just like, you know, either it makes you laugh or, and, uh, and also it's just like I, the other night I was just watching George C. Scott in, uh, Patton mm-hmm. and I've seen Patton many, many, many times. And it just, he owns it. I think that it's something that if, if there's an actor in a performance 
they really own it. Mm-hmm. I mean, Daniel Day Lewis and anything he's done, especially there will be blood. He just, you just through and through that, that is Daniel Plainview. Yeah. And <laughs> there is no one who could do what he does mm-hmm. uh, in that performance, uh, in any of the performances that he's given. Um, and it just, as an actor, it makes you hungry. My like, God, it just makes you want to, you know, get out there and get to work with people like, you know, the Sean Meehams or the, uh, you know, the Zach Lapierre's or, you know, the, the wonderful people that I've had the good fortune to work with over the years or my good friend Lawrence Lesher, you know, in the theater. Mm-hmm. It just, it, it pumps you up when you see a good performance. Okay. Uh, and it just, it, it inspires you, really. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I did notice uh, in your five performances, uh, certainly the first three, which we uh, pointed out at the time, was they're they're all very natural. There there's not really a lot of uh, theatricality to them in the traditional s- definition of that word. Uh, they're all mm-hmm. very they're all from the newer school of acting, all post. Uh, the uh, modern subtlety, method yeah. uh, acting that uh, Brando uh, first was one of the first ones to bring to the screen and on on the waterfront and streetcar, and uh, I I think that does carry through in all five of the uh, performances. There's not really, and I mean I think bottom line it's like that that is really the key to I think any performance that regardless of your background, depending regardless of where you're coming from whether you're just uh, a fan watching a performance or an actor watching another actor perform. I mean, I think that's ultimately the most important thing is that you first and foremost believe that performer. And secondly, that it just feels like you, you almost forget that they're playing a character that they... exactly. Yeah. There's a relatability uh, one of the other people that I had on my list uh, was Paul Giamatti in Sideways. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that performance at the time when that movie came out, yeah. it just came at a time when, oh my God, this <laughs> Alexander Payne, you got you, I mean, me and a friend who saw it, and it's like, like we're, that, I'm Miles. That's the Miles. Uh, yeah. You know, at that time in your life. I think it, you know, also it depends on. You know, when you when you see the film, where you are in your own life, I mean, and it's things that, and when you go back and you see it again, you just, you, you jump, you think back to that. And because uh, movies, movie performances and stage performances like music and any type of performance can, it can entertain and it can enlighten and illuminate as well. And I think that's what a good performance that's what a good performance does. I mean, uh, you know, I've been lucky in my own life and work to make a lot of work on a lot of movies. And a lot of actors, I think, tend to get hooked up, uh, caught up in whether or not they get it right. Mm -hmm. I don't think you ever get it right. I mean, you ask any actor, they all will all say, I wish I had another take. I wish I had another rehearsal, another performance. But usually there's, there's just these fragments that you're happy with, mm-hmm. but, uh, and I'm sure any, any of the, uh, I, I think, you know, any of the actors that we've talked about, uh, I think Judy Dench, I don't think she ever, ever watched herself. Like, I think she has a, a fear because she always would think that like, Oh, I, I did something, didn't do this right. Or I took mm-hmm. too much of a pause here, you know? And it's just it's why we do it. We just, we keep doing it because, uh, it's kind of like uh, kind of like a treasure map, you know. You just kind of, you know, you're not you're not going to find the treasure, but you get a little bit closer up the mountain every time you do it. And yeah. you know, it's uh, and it's fun. I mean, I think when you you still, I mean, Jack Lemmon was w- one of the things I always admired about him. Sissy Spacek told an interesting story when they were doing the movie Missing. Yeah, he would be telling this really, really, really funny story. And the director would say, okay, we're going to set up action. Jack Lemmon would do a scene where he's crying. Cut. He'd go back and telling the funny story. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, and that took years and years and years of training and knowing yeah. his instrument yeah. and, you know, having a confidence 
in his abilities, not in, um, not necessarily like a boastful ego, but like mm-hmm. I think it is important to have, you know, to know I I got this, I own this, and it's and because I think that's when you do the best work. Yeah, yeah, and uh, no, that's and yeah, that that's that's a really good story about Jack Lemon. I completely forget about missing. I know I've. S- I feel like, I think I've seen Missing, but it's been a very long time, and uh, it's, I definitely no. It's see another it again. one of those. He had you know, starting with the China Syndrome. He had the China Syndrome tribute, um, Missing, and you know he had a couple of there in the late seventies, early eighties that he was just knocking him out. Mass Appeal was another one, a uh, very underrated performance. I mean. Uh, <laughs> You know, we could do a whole show on Jack Lennon, but it would take hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I would definitely need to uh, bone up on some of my Jack Lemon watching because, yeah, I've, I've you know, I mean, I, I've seen some like it hot. I've seen The Apartment. I've now seen Days of Wine Roses and Shortcuts and a bunch of his other performances. But, yeah, I mean, I, I know that that's just scratching the surface of him. I mean, really, I mean, any any of these actors that we're talking about, it's like you're the, all of the performances were just scratching the surface. And, uh, Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, if, I mean, Donald Sutherland alone, if he's 57, you know, Clute and, you know, Steelyard Blues and all of those, the mm -hmm. day of the locust. I mean, he's so heartbreaking the day of the locust. And he plays, he plays a guy named Homer Simpson. (laughs) (laughs) But, That's right. Yeah, um, I forgot about that too. But it's, what a it's it's such a heartbreaking. And the thing is, in that day of the look, because he doesn't appear in the movie for like forty five, fifty minutes. But he's so you know, when he does, he's just this he's a time bond. You can tell that this very quiet, meek mild guy that if you push him too much, this guy's gonna break. And the ending of the film, he does in a major way and he pays for it with his life yeah, yeah. well i mean i mean just based on what i'm familiar with with donald sutherland it's like you look at you know he started out in the 70s with mash and then he started out with the 80s and ordinary people it's like you see the range of donald sutherland just in those two performances and it's the same actor, but two completely different characters, and they're both oh, sure. just absolutely fantastic to watch. Yeah, no, he's uh, he is definitely just one of those actors, and you know he can morph from leading roles, supporting roles, character roles. I mean, whenever there's a movie that you always see Donald Sutherland, you know, like ah, oh, I got to see it, you know, just because yeah. if they got him, if they have him in the movie that it elevates. There are certain actors who elevate a movie by their presence. Kathy mm-hmm. Bates is one of them, Patricia Clarkson, a Donald Sutherland, Richard Jenkins, and all of these great, great, great actors who can be leading, who can play leading roles, but also shine in anything that you, you give them. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is, that, that's, this, this, this has been fun. This, is, this has been a fun yeah. discussion. We, we, we covered a lot of ground here. We uh, did, and I would love. I'd love to talk more, but <laughs> I got a. I got a newborn at home, yeah. and uh, a wife who has been, you know, who's been with him all day. And uh, but now, I mean, uh, I I always love talking movies, and it's always a pleasure to talk with you, Brian. Oh yeah, I appreciate it, and uh, thank you very My much. My pleasure. And uh, what what do you have anything other than uh, fatherhood? Do you have anything uh, else going on as far as uh, movies and stage? Coming up, I am uh, I am in the process uh, in pre production on a film called Listen Charlie, which is a comedy. Uh, it's written, produced, and directed by John Henry Soto of John Henry Soto Productions, and I play a it's kind of a kind of a farcical kind of a piece about a lawyer who uh, turns out that he's uh, he's he's angered the wrong kind of people, uh, kind <laughs> of a mob kind of, uh, and it's. Uh, so it's kind of fun where he tries to, you know, <laughs> explain himself. And uh, so I have that coming up. Uh, I'll probably be doing that in the spring and uh, working with some really, really uh, wonderful people on that. And, uh, yeah, other than that, just, uh, you know, doing the drill, getting out there, auditioning, you know, the actor's life of mm-hmm. uh, going out there, auditioning, always looking for good projects, of course. 
uh, films I've done in the past. I'm always uh, trying to get those out to uh, critics, uh, critics like yourself. And uh, now, I mean, uh, it's always good to get uh, get the word out. You know, like I've I've always said, you know, it, it's nice to get nice reviews and pats on the back. But really, ultimately, the most important thing is getting the movie seen because, of yeah. course, there are so many. Yeah movies, whether they're web series or short films or feature films, that uh, the hardest thing is uh, is getting it seen. No, and and that's one of the things that I've really been uh, grateful for with uh, people like yourself over the past decade or so, uh, saying me uh, work either of your own but or work of your friends like you have over the years, and just just re- really being able to not only see some of these films that... Uh, I otherwise probably wouldn't have been able, gotten a chance to see, but also films that, you know, regardless of whether it's a short film or a feature film, regardless of what the type of film it is, it's it's something that broadens my horizons and uh, gets gets me excited about uh, the 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 process of filmmaking just a little bit more in one way or another. And uh, yeah, sure. you've, you've definitely been a big part of that as far as the movies that you've sent me over the years and the discussions we've had over the past couple of years. And yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to doing more in the future. Yeah, no, I mean, it's well, I think, you know, now with everything that's going on in the, the climate that we're in, I think everyone, we just need to support one another as much as possible. You know, whatever level you're at and... We, I mean, everybody, we could all learn from each other, yeah. learn you know, patience and understanding. And now we, we need that now more than ever, I think. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to uh, stop the recording, and make sure everything looks good and uh, get good. that saved. Then uh, we'll be done. So just a minute here. Sounds good. Always a pleasure. I'd like to thank Timothy Cox for uh, joining me for a really wonderful discussion. It was a lot of fun talking with him about acting and the uh, performance that is that inspired him as well as the Academy Awards. I'm going to have more Oscar talk for myself in at the back half of this month where I unveil my 10 best movies of 2017 as well as predict the Oscars myself. I've also got a uh, conversation with Marv Dickey lined up about an Alex Perez film that is near to my heart. And hopefully a uh, discussion with Heather L., who was on a couple, one of the horror uh, podcasts that I did earlier in October, where we discussed the uh, new Planet of the Apes trilogy. That should definitely be a fun conversation, because we both have very different opinions on that one. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, join me at the Sonic Cinema Patreon at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. I've got some more ideas for uh, exclusives for patrons uh, coming down the pike. And for now, this is Brian Scuttle. Thank you very much for joining the Song Cinema podcast, and I hope you enjoyed it. (laughs) 